Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, glad to see so many people here. So my talk meant to be a little bit more relaxing and yeah, chill before the lunch. So I, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, as you can see, I used uh, the, the most meaningful animation on the screen, right? Um, and one could say, hey, man, I don't think it's, it's meaningful. However, if I would say that, you know, goal of this animation is to bring your attention and, and highlight the word, then all of a sudden, start to make sense. So basically the speed and colors that I'm using here, defining how much of attention I want to get on my screen. And that's exactly what we were going to discuss today, how to create something that you know, serves a, a purpose. Um, make sure you use this URL to post all your questions. I'll answer them after the talk. My name is Oksana Savov. I'm a UX engineer at IBM. UX engineer means uh, basically front-end developer with design background and design skills. So I, I do a lot of prototyping and animations and, and motion design. Um, I work on SPSS statistics. This is uh, an application from IBM for statisticians. We are completely redesigning it now. And here's the splash screen that you see when you, know, you are as a brand new user open the application. And we have this metaphor that we are taking you to the, to the stars. So the first thing, the very first experience is like, we are, we're going to welcome you in, in on, on a new planet. We are using carbon design system. I think Stefan Rode mentioned this this morning. It is a, a great set of tools and components that you can use. They're open source. We have React Angular View. Go check that out. It's, it's really cool. And uh, it's not only about components, it also defines things like typography, uh, colors, and motion. And I prepared, I have here a short video for you about how do we do a motion at IBM. Motion brings our work to life. It communicates, guides us forward, and demands focus. Duo's approach to motion design embraces dichotomy, man and machine, organic and engineered. This duality has been distilled down to two modes, productive motion and expressive motion. Productive motion creates a sense of efficiency and precision, while expressive motion delivers enthusiastic and vibrant movement. Together, they create an essential dynamic and rhythm that combines the intuitive and the calculated, the flexible and the fixed. From timing and paths to choreography and consistency, Motion creates engaging experiences that move us toward meaning, insight, and clarity. Awesome. Um, we truly believe that motion design and animation is not something you add at the end of your designing process. We think that it is important to think about how do we leverage motion and how do we tell a story from the very first um, moment when we start to build something. So uh, let me take you to our kitchen. And I <laughs> yesterday we, was co we were cooking uh, a Rex.js, and today I have an animation recipe for you. So step one, find a good purpose. Step two, add a bit of meaning. Step three, serve cold with 60 FPS. And cold because you don't want your user laptop to burn out while they're running your amazing 60 FPS animation. Uh, so yeah, make sure it's. It's cool on average laptop. That's, that's an important thing, not on your i7, uh, I don't know, NVIDIA, super speedy, uh, super fast computer. So yeah, uh, I will walk you through all these steps and we will start from finding a good purpose. And if you go to a dictionary, it says why you do something or why something exists. And if answer to this question is because I can, it's, it's, a, it's a red flag. <laughs> Sometimes I, I, I've seen that a lot, and I did it a lot myself. You get so excited about a technology or a technique that you just learn, that you just start to throw it everywhere. And you're like, I learn how to animate text. I'll do full throttle and animate each and every text I have on my website. And it looks so amazing. But then you start to try to read it and start to use it productively and all of a sudden, it's not that cool anymore because users are annoyed by the stuff like that, especially if they want to 
use your application in a productive way? I think the answer should be more like, because it helps users. And that's, that's a really good purpose. And I have a couple of examples how we can use animation to help our users. One, helps orient in space. I have an example for you. So here we have three screens. And you, as you can see, we, move, uh, we have this slide animation here. And what it, what it communicates to our users is that these three screens, they're equal. And you start to build a map of your application using this uh, metaphor here. And you're probably really familiar with this one. All, all modern phones use this on your home page. And you probably notice that you never circle back to the first screen once, once you reach the last one. And there is a reason for that. Because we want to make sure that you, you learn the map and you can hold it in your head. And you don't have this in a real life. I mean, of course, you can go around the world and get back to where you started. But that's usually not the case on our scale. So it's important to create a map in head of our user and, and communicate the right metaphor. I have an example here. So we see that tabs usually are equal. So this animation that we're using here communicates exactly what, it, what it's supposed to do. Second, uh, show hierarchical relationship. Here I have s really similar animation. Now it does not push the first page. It overlaps the page. And that communicates that they're on different hierarchy level. So really simple example again. You tap on an item, and you go deeper. You understand that. Instead of like going to the sibling page, you go deeper in hierarchy. And again, really simple thing to follow and helps user to build the map that I mentioned before. Uh, third, explains transformations. When you have something on the screen, you want to make sure that it, it is continually throughout the uh, experience. And by using something like this, you communicate that that's still the same object, but you just get more details on it, so you understand that uh, this thing is exactly what you've seen before, but just different perspective. And here's a great example from, from Dribbble, where th you, using this simple animation, you communicate that this is the same object, and you can interact with it. Fourth, uh, drive attention. Um, when you have something on the screen. Um, usually, things do not teleport from one place to another in real life. So it's important to use animation to make sure people connect the dots. They understand that things that I see on the screen uh, have, have their path. And here, you can see that we are using um, special motion path. I'll cover that a bit later. And uh, here's an example where you but the user can add commands. So you write command, you submit it, and then all of a sudden it appears on the top right corner, which makes sense. Number five, engages users. And this is a really tricky one, because you will see things like this on the internet where like uh, this guy is just like randomly looking at your password. And this animation, it, it does not bring that much uh, in terms of functionality. However, it adds this unique personality to our application. It makes it stand out and make it different from hundreds of other similar uh, applications. Um, this one, the next one, uh, I've got from Marco. <laughs> He's, you know, he was sending you a lot of emails, I guess. And this animation MailChimp is using to stress you out before you send hundreds of emails. So he said, like, each time I'm about to send like 400 emails, he sees this animation, he ap and he really appreciates it because it says, hey, man, you ha you've got to be sure that you're doing the right thing right now. And that's really cool. However, you probably notice that you have to have design skills to do stuff like that. But how many designers do we have in the room? Any designers? Awesome, we have some. Yeah, make friends <laughs> with designers. <They're laughs> they are really helpful, right? And um, however, if you don't have design skills and you you want to still like find you know engage users, just like animate cats. 
why not, right? <laughs> People can stare at things like this for hours, and you will just like uh, skyrock your uh, average time of usage of your application, but use it wisely, okay? Um, okay, that was purpose. Next step is meaning. And I have a simple example here of scrolling animation. And when, when we scroll something on our phone, we, we, we really get used to the way it, it moves. And if all of a sudden you see an application that implemented its own way of scrolling, you will notice it immediately. You will be like, something is wrong here. I, I'm not sure what, but users, people are really good at it. They get used to things and they have certain expectations about how things should move on the screen and how, how things should behave. So therefore, we uh, have at IBM defined a couple of ways of easing f in our application. You've already seen it in the, in the video. So we think that for, for productive usage, where we want to make sure that it is, it is you know, not on your way, it does not bother you. We, want, we use pr productive way for animation. If we want to celebrate a special moment on the screen, we use expressive curve here. And that helps a lot to, in our applications. Here are some examples. When you see animation like this, they have to be fast and snappy. However, if you, if you do something like opening a model, we want to celebrate this moment because you're going to the next stage of the application, of the flow. So it could take a little bit more time. Same thing goes with speed and duration. Um, if, you, if you look at this example, we have two drop downs. And one is smaller, second is bigger. And we think that if an object is bigger, it weights more, it, it travels more. So duration of the animation should be slightly bigger so that it, it still feels natural. We have a great tool called IBM Motion Generator, where you can play around. Um, where's my mouse? OK. So you can basically define what kind of move you want to, what kind of property you want to animate, and then what kind of distance it should go, and what is the size of this object. And then you can get basic duration and curve. And that kind of a good starting point for you to understand, OK, if I'm moving an object this long, what is the time? I don't know. but you know, this is a, a great tool to understand that, to get some uh, sense of the, of the timings. And next thing, choreography, a really important one. When I say choreography, you probably think about that. No, not really, I don't mean that. So choreography is more about like in user interfaces where how things are animated. And our engineering brain will always say us that um, if you want to animate something from point A to point B, you have to use straight line. Like, why the hell would you use something else? That's the most efficient, the most natural way to, for things to move. However, if you, if you talk to someone with art background, they think that line, straight line, is the most boring thing on, in the world. You, like, did you see uh, many paintings with, with straight line? Or imagine that, all dancers would just like use straight lines to, to make their dances. It's, it's something that you know we have to switch off uh, our engineering mind and be a little bit more creative and think about how does this object would move in real life if you if you drop something into panel, how it would how it would fall there. Um, yeah, no straight lines, but sometimes they actually make sense. So. Don't over, do not overthink this. And the last step is surf code with 60 FPS. And this is technical part of my talk. OK, uh, let's get into that. So here is pixel pipeline. Whenever we animate something frame by frame, we run JavaScript that changes styles. Then browser have to, has to recalculate styles. It has to run layout. It has to paint. And then it has to compose layers. And if we want to get 60 FPS, that means for each frame, for each of these steps, we have 16.6 .6 milliseconds to get it right. Sounds like a really challenging problem. And 
as an example of, for this, I want to implement something like this. So we have a real-time animation where we have a, a, a touch start, and then we swipe something to the right, and we want to make it performant. So here is simple HTML that would be behind this kind of thing. We have just lists and list of items. Doesn't matter what's inside. What we'll do next, we'll um, basically get all the items and add event listeners. Next step, I skipped here the um, handle start uh, event. But you can imagine that I'm storing the start uh, position, that I keep tracking the last position of the, of the touch event. And next step is this, e pending step. Just because uh, events could fire much more, much more than we could actually draw on the screen, we need to make sure that we do not try to, you know, over, over, uh, over paint to the, to the screen so that we, we use only time when, where, when the browser is able to, to update the screen. So that's why there is a pending thing here. And we say, if, 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 if we don't draw anything right now, we say, OK, we, we're going to draw now. We're going to create, uh, use request animation frame to schedule next animation. And in our animate function, we're going to say, OK, we're done with, with, with uh, painting. And then we're going to calculate um, tr translate x value based on our last and initial position. And then we just change style of, the, of an object. In this case, it's element style left. And, and this is a uh, wrong way. <laughs> if we go to csstriggers.com slash left, we'll see that for uh, different browsers, so it's uh, Gecko, WebKit, Edge, the, it, changing this property requ requires browser to run uh, layout, paint, and compose. However, what we want to do, we want to use an animation property that is cheap to use. And we have only a couple of these. And we always have to stick to them. And one of these would be transform. So as you can see, it, it uses only last step, which is layout. And that's, this is much faster. Um, by, by, by switching to element style, transform, translate x, we basically eliminated two steps from our pixel pipeline. And we've got much more time for us to do JavaScript and do styling. And browser just need to recompose the layers. OK. More interesting example. So here, I'm using a special curve. As I said, f choreography requires you to think about how object would behave in real life. And if you think about how would an item drop on the floor, it, it would never go with a straight line. It would use the special curve. And how to build animation like this is, is really an interesting challenge. Who of you familiar with flip technique? All right. So it's really cool technique from Paul. Um, this acronym means first, last, invert, play. And this technique is based on, on one interesting fact about people, that when you interact with in the software, you have 100 milliseconds to give a response to users. And if it's within 100 milliseconds, user would think that it's instantaneous. If who of you heard about Rail? And one more acronym. That's the last one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So Rail is a, is a technique from Google that describes exactly things like this. What I mentioned before. So you have 50 milliseconds. I mentioned 100 milliseconds, but because browser has to do extra steps of like pr uh, processing input from users, you have actually 50 milliseconds to answer to your user. You want to do 10 milliseconds per frame. You want to maximize idle time and you want to load your content under five seconds. I have a link to that uh, right there. So go check it out. It's really awesome. But w in my talk, we are interested only in two things, response within 50 milliseconds and animation within 10 milliseconds. So how do we use this response within 50 milliseconds to boost our animation? 
let's go with, let's, let's try to create the animation that I showed you before. So here we have, again, list, and then we have panel down there. It's empty right now, so we're going to add event listeners. We're going to get all items and then add click event to each of them, because uh, click and tap the, the same, basically. And next step, we're going to handle this tap event. So first step, we're going to create a new item because we need to clone the item that was originally clicked. And for simplicity, I'm just using document create element div. And right away, I'm appending this item to the panel. Some people might think, OK, it must be must like you have a flick on your screen where you have like something down there and then it moves somewhere else. No, it's not going to happen because when you add something to your to, to a DOM element, that doesn't mean that browser will stop executing JavaScript and will go and add something there and then go back to, you know, it will wait until JavaScript is executed and then get back to rendering. So we are fine here to add element. We, we can, now we are using basically, we start to use this 50 milliseconds that we have to pre-calculate all the animation. So what's going to happen? We're going to have HTML like this. There is already panel item down there. And this is the trick. We're going to calculate positions of the starting element of and the end element. What it's going to do, it's going to run this shortened pipeline, JavaScript pipeline, without actually rendering. So we are asking browser, hey, browser, give us the correct number, but do not render that. You don't need to just run layout for us. We just need to know values. And we have values, and based on these values, we can calculate start x, start y, and x, and y, and y, and understand where the animation will start and where the animation will end. Based on these values, we can create Bezier curve. And I'll tell you later why it's so important to create it. I'm using a special JavaScript library to create it. And if you're not familiar with Bezier curves, it's something like this, where you have a couple of dots and you, you use it in SVG. Uh, you probably use it in SVG a lot. And you, you basically describe how the curve will look like by describing, in this case, four points. And why I'm using this? Because there is an amazing CSS property that can animate things along the line that we define in this way, called offer path, offset path. And we, in this example, I'm just adding animation using CSS three seconds move along the line. And what I'm animating is called offset distance. Really simple, and this property will actually help us to build the animation. So next step for us is to calculate ratio. We want to scale it down to the, uh, wait, scale it up, and then scale it back down, and transform the, the scale property. Then we want to set the correct offset path. So here I'm using path.svg or to, uh, to SVG that comes from this library that I mentioned before. And next step, I'm just setting animation move 0.6 seconds forwards. And uh, in my CSS, I'm going to have something like this. From zero, go to offset distance 0%, then scale it to the normal size, and on the last step, move it al along the line to the 100%. Um, Really simple, right? However, uh, there is a problem. So it will work good with this particular example, but what if we go into the bigger screen? What if we click on an item that is really close to the target? Because we hard-coded the timing, the duration for the animation. That means that the animation that is like really close will be like, mm, I'm so slow, and people will be really annoyed about that. So why don't we use something better? Web Animations API. And step one, uh, and this is exactly why I, I'm using the, the library for Bezier, because I can, I can get distance, I can get length of the curve from this library, and it's pretty powerful. Based on this le length, I can calculate duration that comes, this, this function uh, could be, we have this function in IBM Motion package from NPM, However, you could also uh, implement it uh, on your own. So as you can see, it has distance and size of the element. So you could create a function that, based on distance and size, define the 
basically the speed of how fast it should move. And next I'm going to calculate the ratio of how the, uh, wh what would, would be the scale ratio between start and end position. And then I'm going to animate it. This is a syntax from Web Animations API. Um, and what you see here, I can use dot animate. It's not jQuery, it's just native now, pretty cool. And then I can see it transform, go from scale ratio to scale one. And I can use scale duration as a time for this animation. Unfortunately, uh, promises are not yet there. They will be available, I guess, soon. But not for now, you need to use scale animation dot on finish to actually know that animation was completed if you want to do the next step. Because in my, in my example that I showed you before, first I scale it down and then I move it. So that's, that's why we have two separate animations here. And what it gives us, we can take this offset distance, say I want you moved along the line, and duration will be the one that we calculated. And we are going to use this kind of function and we're going to move forward. And what it gives us? A responsive animation. Pretty cool. So it doesn't matter how far or how close it is to the, to the target, it will still the, will use the right curve as well as the right duration. So it would feel the same on mobile device, it will feel the same on desktop, it will feel the same on your on using a smaller phone. Um, bad news. <laughs> so offset path, it's not yet there. I'm working on an Electron application, so w which means Chrome. And we're like, OK, well, that's fine. Uh, but for others, there are polyfills and uh, libraries that can help you to solve that. Um, with Web Animations API, it's a little bit better. So it's available in, in a lot of modern browsers. However, as I said, specifications are really, really cool, but they are not yet implemented. So we need to wait a bit to, to, get, it, to get all the cool th things about the animation CPI. So last trick that I have in the end, like if, you're, if you did all of that and your laptop is still hot, try to use will change property. You see this star over there saying like potentially increase the performance. There's always like a tiny, tiny font somewhere saying like all, all the details <laughs> that you have to know. So use it wisely. It, it could, what it does, it actually says, hey browser, I, I will animate this property on this particular object. So you could or you could not, that's up to you, optimize for it. And it could take the, the uh, items that you are will, will going to animate and, and put them on different layers, so which is obviously using more memory, and you're never sure what's going to happen. But the guide says that if you add will change, make sure you remove it when you don't need it, because you it might you know shoot you in, in the leg. Yeah. Um, I have some useful links for you. Um, first is uh, our, our motion guide from our carbon design team. Uh, there is amazing article from material design on understanding motion. They have a lot of examples of how to use uh, animations to in improve your user experience. Um, there is Motion Manifesto, a great Medium article. Really recommend you to read it. Uh, Ultimate Guide to Animations by Taras, and amazing library, uh, Anime by Julian. Let's animate. Uh, voila, thank you all. Thank you very much, Alex. This was a really great talk. Now we have a couple of questions for you. First question is how to be sure that your animations are running under 60 frames per second? Oh, great question. Uh, Google Chrome, uh, Chrome to Dev Tools have this amazing uh, performance tab where you can open your website or anything and you can record your animation and you will see how many FPS you have in, in, in different uh, points of time, what kind of functions you execute 
and how to how to get to 60 fps so it's it's the best tool ever for animation so just yeah i would say perf uh, performance tab okay did you had some problems to implement animations on different browsers specifically safari yes <laughs> <laughs> yes it um how yeah, just solve that. Uh, so, uh, you switch the browser. Uh, no, that's not how you solve it. So CSS is always was like place for the the most creative people to create uh, some crazy hacks, um, you know. And I think that's one of the way we are solving problems like this is just like finding workarounds because beauty of CSS is that. There are tons of problems, but there are hundreds of ways of doing things, so you can always find your way somehow. However, you have to make sure that you know performance is still there, because otherwise we would just remove the animation completely for a particular use case. Like it's it's much better to have no animation than bad animation, right? Okay, next question is IBM Motion Package open sourced? Yes. It's uh, go to Carbon Design System, check it out, and you will find a lot of links. Um, yeah. Okay, now, what happens when your inner designer and inner developer get into clash? Who wins? Oh, wow. <laughs> what happened? We, we, we talk. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's it's a it's a great question. It happens it happens sometimes when you like, uh, you know, you have some 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 data structure, and the best way to represent this data structure is this. However, y use f it doesn't make s any sense to users like your data structure, like what what they're talking about. So I think the best way to solve things like this is actually go and ask what what do your users think about this particular use case. Just show it and see, because your understanding of the problem and solution is, is most likely wrong. <laughs> okay, how do you decide how much animation is enough? So when do you stop animating? <laughs> when I'm tired. No. <laughs> so uh, I think I think we we have this design process that we are using and animations is something that we are again built into this process so that we when we create an experience it should work for animation would support it which means that if there is no purpose or now no like reason to add animation we won't add it it's all about what exactly we want to communicate and it really depends on the product itself because most of the products that we are building they are really for professional users for enterprise users that don't have time to enjoy your amazing 60 FPS, uh, I don't know, r robot moving across the street or Clippy. Um, so, which, which means we, we, we always keep in mind that we have professional users and we should never, ever, ever should annoy them <laughs> by what we do. Kay. Should we be animating while developing or include them once the app is done? Uh, it really depends on the use case. Some of the animations there, are so like take the uh, drag and drop animation. There is no way you will postpone it till the end because this is an essential thing of, of this interaction pattern that you have. So it must be built in from the very beginning. However, if you have something like, um, you know, move from page to page animation, that's something that could come later it's easy to edit later, so why not, right? Okay, someone requested for good advanced animation resources that you could recommend, I guess something more advanced from the list you provided at the end. Oh, some advanced stuff. I'm, what, what kind of advanced? <laughs> I know maybe the like person do asking this question can specify. Because again, uh, I, I didn't talk about gaming animations here at all. I was m focusing m on purely on <laughs> UI animations. And this is a really specific subset of anim like most of the resources and most of the things there are around how do you animate objects in, in uh, let's say, WebGL or things like that. That's really advanced, it's it, but it's different set of problems, so resources will be different. 
if you do animations in, in user interface, then I think, again, uh, carbon or material design, great resources to, to check out all the, all the techniques and, and guidelines for that. Okay. Is the presentation done in JavaScript? Yes. I mean, CSS JavaScript, so it's like, uh, I, I, I've created it out of code pens, so it's like each slide, most of the slides are code pens. Um, yeah, I'm not proud of them though. Okay, but you will <laughs> provide the link to the Yeah, slide. later on, I need to remove some confidential stuff. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, how do you handle CSS prefixes when you use a transfer method in JavaScript? So as I said, I'm, I'm building an Electron application. We, I'm working on an Electron application, which means no, uh, no prefixes, no nothing. You just use whatever Chrome provides you with. So I, however, uh, back, uh, back in the days when I was working on something for, for, uh, for cloud, uh, we we use just like random random tools for that, post CSS. I I don't know. Okay, and the next question is: Can you overuse will change property? Like if you use it too much, can it it's lose easy. the speed? Yeah, don't use it. Don't use it unless you're desperate. <laughs> so that's literally what's written in the in the guide that this is your your like last thing that you want to try because if you just randomly put I don't know body star will change, transform. Browser will, will sur survive. They will won't let you crash the browser. However, things that work fast could get slow. So you just like you, you just give wrong hint to your browser. You're like, I'm going to animate everything and browser like, I don't know what to do. Yeah. So make sure you you add this property before you start animate and you remove it as soon as you're done with your animation. So these dribble animations and designs you had, that you said it's all in CodePen, right? Uh, which one? The dribble animations that you showed oh, on your uh, slides? No, dribble animation are dribble. <laughs> but the animations that were like uh, this isometric uh, animations there on, on CodePen. Okay. Um, have the non-Chrome browser vendors committed to ship the new path CSS property? Let's say it again. Have have the non-Chrome oh. browsers or browser vendors committed to ship the new path CSS property? I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe people from, we have people from Mozilla, right? So maybe they know. <laughs> okay, now one really interesting one. How do you test your animations also oh, across browsers? My, oh my God, that's a great question. So, uh, I was focusing mostly on Chrome, and Chrome has this amazing animation tab. Uh, so one is performance tab, cool, and there is another one that's hidden a little bit. But what it does, it actually allows you to slow down your animation to 10% and run it frame by frame, and you can literally see like the curve, the each frame you do, you render on the screen, and that's so, so useful for something that is more complicated than just like a hover effect. And then you can use something like Puppeteer to take screenshots and compare yeah. the pixels. Oh, wow, you mean test, like, uh, yeah, you like in CI? No, you know, we like don't do that. Unit tests, integration tests. Y oh my god, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, I think they're, they're, like, would your user be, be unhappy if your animation is like 10 milliseconds later, late today? I don't know, like, but, Testing is great. I don't want to say it's bad, but for some things like animation, especially now on front end, it will probably take you so much time to keep it up to date and keep it, te uh, you know, uh, running. So it, m I would assume it won't make sense, mm -hmm. but who knows? Yep. Okay, we are out of questions. In case you have still more questions, if something still pops up. Feel free to approach our speaker and please give a warm welcome. Oh, warm, thank you, sorry. <laughs>